Or do you make sure you turn around? I said, you'll make sure you turn around. I'll call you like I just did while I'm done. Check, check. Well, have you guys look at that. No, I come from these big churches that How's this work? Do you, is it is it working now? Okay. I didn't need my hearing aids on. No, it's not. <laughs> I want to meet two other people here before yeah. we begin. I didn't meet this table. Yeah. 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 Be careful. He's trying to decide who's going to be the assistant. Don't be too careful. All the bars is on. Okay, uh, is everybody here? <laughs> oh. Boy, what a, what a nice crew. Thank you for being here tonight, especially since we're the last people left in town right now. <laughs> Might as well come and spend it with a nerd for an hour, right? <laughs> Let's see, we got some seats for you guys? Okay, now the, you guys in the back, I haven't met you, so come up afterwards and shake my hand, okay? Because I like to meet people, and this is a, uh, this almost looks like uh, one of my graduate courses. <laughs> 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 Except you're better looking than those guys. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I'm glad we got a clock here too. So can you hear me back there, okay? Um, I can project if I have to, but I don't talk nearly as fast as pastor. <laughs> so I've learned to slow it down when I got here. You can tell I'm a Yankee. I'm not a Southerner, but 
I had to slow it down like, like, like to 45. When I first got here from the Northeast, I was talking like 70, and nobody could understand me in the classes. So I slowed it down, I'm, I'm better now. So anyway, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well again, thank you guys for uh, being here. And uh, are, are we praying for the folks at the beach and in Israel? Have you guys watched some of the slides coming back from yeah. Israel? Get online and look at the slides. They're beautiful slides. And uh, I just want to say thank you to Jeff for uh, trusting uh, me with you. <laughs> like I say, he's walking on faith here. You know, he, I've only known Jeff for a couple of months. And I've only been here for a couple of months. And I've been kind of just sitting by myself, kind of, you know, low-key trying to figure out if I can work in this church work meaning is this where my passion is can I bring this to this church and so I really have really appreciated meeting the people I have I really love the music here don't you love your choir director I mean that guy I've never seen this before you know <laughs> first time I saw that I saw it you know I kind of sat like like in the first row almost and his butt's going up and down. <laughs> I'm going, anybody that that's pa that, that passionate about music, I'm going to like. <laughs> so, so tell Bruce, uh, <laughs> he's doing a great job. All right, so what I've tried to do tonight, I did talk to Jeff about this a little bit. <laughs> and we sort of agreed that a good talk would be to tell you what ministry is like in a secular, highly secular world that I, that I play in, which is a university. Now I'm lucky to be at Auburn because we have a lot more Christians per capita than just about any, at any institution, but I've been at institutions all over the country. I typically probably have spoken at about 200 universities around the country in my lifetime. And that's one of the things I wanna tell you that I think I can help you, I can help your children, uh, I can help your uh, high school students that may be thinking about a college, I could probably save them a visit to that college if they talk to me, I probably have been there. So uh, I've been in all 50 states, <laughs> the only one I, I didn't go to is Oklahoma, and I just drove over to Oklahoma to just say I was in all 50 states, so <laughs> went to Tulsa and got out of there, you know. Uh, so. So what we agreed to do is, Jeff and I, is to <coughs> kind of give you an overview of what I do, how I do it, and the best way to do that is to kind of borrow from a skeleton of a talk that I've, been, that I've given in the past. I first gave this at Woodstock First Baptist um, up in Atlanta. Mostly what I've been doing for all my time at Auburn is ministry outside of the city of Auburn for some reason, and it's just because God led me there. So I did a lot of work in Atlanta for many years. Uh, I last was at Columbus, Georgia, at a large church there. And uh, it's almost time to me to maybe come home and minister to my hometown instead of everywhere else. So that's what my thinking is. And he wanted you to, he wanted me to uh, use something personal so you could get to know me a little bit. And I wanna get to know each and every one of you I love meeting people. I'm a people person. I'm a teacher. <laughs> Met some teachers already here. We have an instant camaraderie because we all have teachers' hearts, those of us that are teachers. Now I do a lot more than that and I want to describe a little bit of that too as I go. So here's the plan of attack here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to drone on until a quarter after <coughs> and then for 15 minutes I'm going to show you some spectacular pictures of nature. I want to send you out on a positive note. Uh, this is why I went into science, is because it's all God. Yes. It's all God. And I've seen nature in places that the average person would never see. That's why I like to take a lot of pictures. I've taken my group and the group of people that have worked with me in, and throughout my career at Auburn and elsewhere, we've probably taken a million pictures of nature. And I just brought like 15 of them <laughs> to show you tonight. So, uh, 
So I want you to catch a glimpse of why a guy like me would go into science. You don't meet many people like me. So that's why I say well, that point zero 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 six percent I'm going to show you how I calculated that. But that's the percentage of me that you'll meet in society. There's not many of us who, who are is a practicing professional physicist. That word scares just about everybody. I was talking to people at Parker Hall. The, the thing that most people remember about Parker Hall alumni is that that was the most godforsaken place because it was chemistry and physics and math. <laughs> and it's, oh my gosh, that was the worst class I ever had, you know, that kind of thing. <coughs> but yet I'm being asked for bricks from that place before Parker Hall goes down. So those will go on sale for about $500 after, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So anyway, that's what I want to do. Now, the, the two questions that always people ask me, you know, I get on a plane, I open up my briefcase, you see my business card is, are, are you guys like Sheldon? Are you all like Sheldon? Now, you know who Sheldon is, right? That guy on the Big Bang, a nerdy guy? Well, I'm going to let you judge that after listening to me drone on here today. So you can decide whether I'm as nerdy as those guys or not. I'm hoping I'm not. I'm not going to take a vote, though. <laughs> <laughs> the other question is, and this is the one I'm going to focus on a little bit here. People, uh, the second question is, how, how do you even become this? How, how do you get a doctorate in physics? What do you do with that? Is there jobs available? I mean, wh how did you land up at Auburn? Why have you been, uh, where have you been? And I can tell you point blank, this is, the, this is an exciting adventure from God. And I do have some advice for parents tonight as I go through some of these slides. So uh, that's where we're headed here tonight. Now, this says, this was a talk originally for the Crew Faculty Commons. Crew is Campus Crusade for Christ ministry. They have a special division of it called Faculty Commons. And a guy um, from uh, Alliance Defending Freedom and myself <coughs> used to go around, especially in the Atlanta and South Carolina area, Clemson University, and we would try to be an encouragement to professors that were struggling at the secular university level. Scared to death, not knowing what they can say or not. Are they going to get written up because they say, I'm a believer in Jesus? Um, how do you even am I going to get tenure? Now I've spent all these years getting a, a PhD in something and I could get knocked off here just because I'm a professing believer. So we wanted to go, go around and uh, they wanted uh, most of the people we talked to wanted two speakers. They wanted one guy who could come and talk about First Amendment, free speech, what you can legally say in the classroom and your bosses can't touch you, theoretically. And then they wanted a guy who is in the ground level, in the trenches, that's me. How, do I, how did I do this all these years? And I seem to have done pretty well. I'm still, I'm still here, you know, I'm still with Auburn. <laughs> so so that's, that's what this was about. And so my story here tonight is how I did this how I was able to maneuver through all of this milieu and, and I'll still be standing tonight. So here's sort of the outline. <coughs> Christian professors disappearing on secular campuses. We are. Even at Auburn. I'll give you the data on that in just a minute. How did I get into this craziness? How <laughs> did you become a nerd? Uh, and then how I roll. And I, I think I always look, have looked at my life as you glorify God in everything you do. So I can glorify God in my teaching. I spend about 15% of my time at Auburn doing that. I can glorify God in physics research. I do that about 70% of my time. I'm mostly a guy that runs these, helps to run these large centers, scientific centers at Auburn, bring in dollars, et cetera, like that. So I, I say to some parents, I'm kind of the, like Nick Saban, except I'm on the academic side. Nick Saban, why did Al Alabama hire him? <laughs> okay, to get them on the national scene, to get them a national championship, 
to recruit great football players, to great, have a great program, and to put this state on the map. Like before I came to Alabama, that's all I knew about Alabama was Auburn and Alabama and Bo Jackson. <laughs> I didn't know anything about Auburn. I came from the West Coast. I came from Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley to Auburn, Alabama, God does have a sense of humor, you know, kind of thing. You know? <laughs> I would have never, I would have never have thought I, I would be happy here. This is, but that was the best decision I made, you know, because God made the decision. And then I want to talk about outreach, which is 15%. That's kind of what I do extracurricular wise. I write books. I'm a book author, a Christian book author, et cetera. So we'll get to that here. And then fun science photos. Those are coming up in about 35 minutes. Okay, now here's some of the data here on this. And really, I don't want to read all this, but what this amounts to is this. There's been a number of studies of how diverse faculty is in American universities. Now, diverse <laughs> in my context means <coughs> are they believers or not? And the unfortunate answer to this is for every 95 professors, only five are Christians. Out of 100 professors, 95 are from the left, people of the left, and only 5% are people of the right. And that's politically left and right. Now, under that five, how many of those people on the right might be believers, okay? So we're talking low, low numbers here already. And the number that you'll be mostly concerned with is this last one, because I did a little study of Auburn. And uh, I'm going to have to move around here a lot, because I'm not used to being confined here. <coughs> I'll show you this ad here, but we put an ad in the uh, Plainsman every year during Iron Bowl week. I don't know if you know that. And so we, we, we write our professors on campus, the ones especially that are Christian, and say, would you be willing to put your name on this article as you're, you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Well, it turns out that 41 out of 1,300, Auburn at the time had 1,300 professors. 41 felt comfortable putting their name on that ad. Now, that amounts to 3%. The national average is about 5%. So even at Auburn, you know, people are, to are really not comfortable. Now let me show you the ad here. And this is, uh, you can't see this whole thing very well because I had to, I didn't have a good uh, copy of it, but here's what we did. This was Iron Bowl week. And this was in 19 eight, or 2018. We claim no bragging rights. We quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And having received God's gift of eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ, we are a group of professors, lecturers, instructors, administrators, and staff united by our common experience. We believe that Jesus provides intellectually and spiritually satisfying answers to life's most important questions. We are available to students, faculty, and staff who might like to discuss such questions with us. If you would like to be a part of the fellowship, contact John Hung and Danny Blessing, who was the head of our group at that time. And that was the AU Christian faculty group. So we put this in both the Crimson Tide paper, some called the Crimson White, and our paper during Iron Bowl Week. Just, and we put both, both schools and the names of the people who, who, who would claim, feel comfortable claiming that. And that amounted to 3%. Now, I know there's more Christians at Auburn than 3%. But a lot of those people are not comfortable putting their name in this, you know, because of what I was saying earlier. So uh, <coughs> one of the things I note from this is that an average student picking an average university out there, there's a very good chance they will not have one Christian professor in their school. Not one. Okay, because of these, these numbers are so low. And uh, <coughs> the second thing I noticed, you see Alabama looks like they got more than Auburn there, right? I'm not liking that when I first saw that. <laughs> well, it turns out that we both have about an equal number of professors on that list, but Alabama didn't get the message and they put a whole bunch of people in addition, they were mostly coaches. 
And, and traveling around the country, that's what I've been finding. If you want to see, find Christians in universities, they're in the athletic department. <laughs> and you know, because y- you've had our coaches come around, right? Yeah. I know. So uh, that's just the way, the way the land goes here. I'll skip that one. <laughs> now let me talk to you about the sciences. They're even worse. This is even worse than that 95 to 5 ratio. So let me, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, but this, where, this is where I get that number point zero 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 six. It's really bad in the sciences. Now, ask myself, how many, how many physics PhDs does our whole country produce in a year? Okay, now I, I was shocked at this number. I thought there was a lot more. Turns out there's only about 1,800, 1,800. That has been going down too. Uh, well, for right now, it's going up a little bit, right. and it's because people like Meta, you know, one of my Silicon Valley companies, <laughs> I was with Intel rather than Meta. The at, the median salary at Meta. Okay, now this is the median, meaning you start at the bottom and there's a salary, and then you stack up on stairs all the salaries at Meta, which is Facebook, you know, Zuckerberg. Mm-hmm. Okay. The median salary is the middle salary, the middle step. $295,000. That's the middle step. So that means half the company's making more than that, half is making less than that. Now I'm gonna show you in a little bit. We, I've sent a lot of people out there as P, young PhDs, they get hired by a lot of the Fortune 500 companies. I hate to tell you they're making more than me. <laughs> so I'm saying to them, hey, hey, just remember who got you this, but you know, you know I want equipment, I want electron microscopes free, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt that you gave me, you know, a flight out there and set me up on the beach for a week somewhere, you know, so <laughs> I'm messing with them all the time. But anyway, if you just, there's a lot of ways to measure this, but if you put 1850, that's the number, average number of physicists produced by our country. Now, we're the technological leader, by the way, too, and that, that is not very many. So if you take that 1850 and divide it by the U.S. population, that's where you get that number, six in a million. So that's why you never met somebody like me, probably, because there's six in a million chance. So think of, you know, think of Bryant Denny Stadium. They have 100,000 people in that stadium. Think 10 of those. You know, that's a million, and you'll only find six. <laughs> They're all probably in the locker room or somewhere. Mm. So my conclusion is there's not very many Sheldons out there. There's even fewer American Sheldons, because well, most of the people going into science now are non-Native Americans. That's why you hear all the complaints. I can't understand my teacher. He's from Romania or he's from Russia, or he's from somewhere else, you know. I mean, I don't think I'm that great of a teacher, but I can, you know, I look good sometimes <laughs> compared to people who don't speak the native language. And there's even fewer Christian Sheldons. And in my conclusion, it's just a God miracle I ever made it. It's a God miracle I ever made this in life. And I wasn't a silver spoon born person. So, uh, a funny thing about this, you guys, <laughs> if you look at the breakout of this, these are postdocs, these are potentially permanent positions and other temporary positions. That means most of these are temporary positions. <laughs> you know? So you go all through this and get your doctorate and then you get a temporary position. So I'm in this sector here, a hundred of a hundred people actually are hired in tenure track positions every year. A hundred. <laughs> so that's even worse. I mean, that number point zero 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 six would even go lower if I wanted to compare it on that basis. All right, I almost hate to show this, but I want to I want to make a uh, couple of observations of this for you parents. And I get asked this a lot. How do you how do you become a physicist? I mean, how did how did God do this for you? And this is the craziest way to do it you're ever gonna wa- you're ever gonna see. Well, let's go along with the top here. <laughs> I started out, <laughs> this is a Spartan. 
from Michigan State. That's the school that just had the shootings up there. And it just broke my heart. I, I went into that building many times. It's called Berkey Hall up at, up at in East Lansing. And that will never be the same up there at Berkey Hall. Everybody goes in there, and it's right by the student union, too. So these are, uh, you know, principal buildings in Michigan State. And so pray for our people up there. Um, by the way, I am from there. I was born in Lansing, Michigan, which is five miles away from Michigan State's campus. So that's why I went there. So I got my bachelor's and master's there. Now I've got this NSCL there, which refers to this, National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory, Nuclear Physics, okay? Now that's one of the best labs in the world. In fact, it's no longer NSCL, it's a new lab <laughs> the, that, that the state of Michigan and your tax dollars and uh, a, a few other people put in. It's about $750 million facility to basically upgrade this to a new modern facility now. And it just opened up last year. And I was able to go up there and be, be there for the open house. Boy, that got, I, I was all excited. And then you can see what I did. Now this is in chronological order. Then I, I got a degree in theology. And look here, I only became, became a Christian in college. Now, there's a lot of you that have been to college and been to grad school. Nobody would ever advise you to get a, de a degree in physics and then just get out of it for two years and go to seminary and then try to get back into it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There was a tremendous risk involved with this. There was a risk right there because most people say, you'll never do this. You'll never make this. I mean, all those people are geniuses. You're just a blue collar guy, you know? Uh, so there was, there was risk there, there was risk there. I did get a PhD from the University of Oregon. That's why I got this duck thing there. <laughs> the most unusual basketball court in the world. Have you ever seen that basketball court? It looks like a, a forest painted on the basketball court. So I got my degree there. I did a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. It's a, you heard, anybody heard of Carnegie Mellon? Okay, Carnegie Mellon. That's the most unusual school I was at. That's an amalgam of what was the Carnegie Institute of Technology, think Georgia Tech, and the Mellon School of Arts and Drama. So you could be on one side of the campus as completely nerds, you're clicking all the time of computers, and then you walk across and you hear somebody singing arias, <laughs> you know, <laughs> acting, you know, things like that. So the actor from that school that you might know if you watch Castle, you ever watch that show Castle? Castle has two detectives working for, for her. And one of the guys is from the, the Mellon School of Drama. Okay, George Papard, for those of you that are, <laughs> you gotta be fairly old for George Papard, was from that school. Nancy Marchand, who used to be on Lou Grant, the old Lou Grant television show. Okay, she was the boss, the lady boss. She was from Carnegie Mellon School of, uh <laughs> anyway, it was a really interesting place. So, and then after that, I, I went to Silicon Valley and I was the chief uh, scientist at Intel. So I'm the guy that you can kick if your computers are not working right. So and I noticed that this one doesn't even say where this is, this is your, this is the church laptop. Oh, it's a MacBook, so you see, <laughs> I'm going to have to give somebody a talking to here. Summers, Los Alamos National Lab, that's the lab out in New Mexico where they, the, the geniuses uh, of the atomic bomb era developed the atomic bomb. LLNL, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, that's the place if you've been reading about fusion energy. That's where they did it at that lab. I had some, some collaborations there when I was out in the West Coast. Uh, people ask me sometimes, where, where is Intel? It's the heart of Silicon Valley. It's Santa Clara, California. For those football people, it's right down the street from where the 49ers play. Okay? So in Santa Clara, you fly into San Jose. A little, go a little bit to the west, and that's where you'd see Intel. 
Now, hybrid background, this is another one. <laughs> I have a physics degree, postdoc in chemistry. You see, this is, says surface chemistry. Then I headed up a material science group in industry and a fi Fortune 500 electronics. So, you know, you can imagine uh, there's, a, there's a problem here where, okay, Auburn gets this and they're going, okay, looks good. Physics fits, oh, what? Well, what is that? <laughs> and then they go down here and they say, whoops, what is that? What, are you a physicist, a chemist? And then they go down to here and say, are you an industrial scientist or are you an academician? <laughs> but yet here I stand. So God got me through all of this. And that took 12 years. Now for your parents, I knew what I wanted to do in eighth grade. And I stuck to my guns for the most part, working like a dog. But if you parents find your child loves something that sounds really weird, like this, my, my parents didn't even know what physics was, you know. So I just said, a teacher. <laughs> I was like, I'll be a teacher. They understood that. But you got to let God lead your kid. You gotta let God lead your kid. You gotta have co enough confidence in God that God will take care of your child. And after this point in life, you're a mentor, but you're, you're on your knees, you're the prayer person in your child's <coughs> life. So, you know, you can't, you, I, I mean, almost the best thing that happened to me was I had really no parental guidance during this, which also meant I didn't have anybody saying, are you stupid or what? You know, <laughs> so, so, you know, go after your passion. You know, one of the other talks I give is called, Will You Take Passion or the Purse? You see, this, 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 this happened here. You can imagine how much money I was making. And then I'm going to Auburn? You know what salary drop that is? <laughs> mm. <laughs> And really, when I got to Opelika, I mean, I, I didn't know where I was hardly. I had only one person here, the guy that hired me, and he was gone. So I, I moved into Opelika, believe it or not, because it was cheaper. I didn't know one person, not one person. So what a risk that was, at least I thought. It was the best thing for me. It was best just to let God, you know, God do the, God do the schematic diagram and I just work on the wires, you know. I'm the electron going <laughs> pushing through the wires, you know. So, um, any case, I spent way too much time on that. <laughs> Since you're in the Southern Baptist Convention, you probably wonder what is this seminary I went to. So I brought one slide to tell you what this seminary is, just in case you wonder if I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> This was called Western Conservative Baptist Seminary. Now here's the way I think of it. I think of it as what I've got here. The Nelson Study Bible and DTS West. Now DTS stands for Dallas Theological Seminary. <coughs> this was basically a West Coast version of Dallas. Most of the professors were from Dallas. The president of the school was from Dallas. During, col during uh, uh, times on Wednesday when we had chapel, we had a lot of professors from Dallas come up and talk to us. So this was a sort of a West Coast version of Dallas. It's in Portland, Oregon, of all places, you know, that real liberal city, you know. And uh, this was the president uh, of the school. Now, he was the editor-in-chief of this study Bible. So if you have a Nelson study Bible, go check your, go check your collection of Bibles. You know, we all got... 20 Bibles, and if you have a Nelson Study Bible, that was this seminary's Bible. All of my professors who taught me wrote the notes and all of the chapters of the Bibles, and a lot of guys from Dallas did too. You know, Lee Volvord, I don't know if you, he was the president of Dallas for many years, he, wrote, he, he did some of our notes. And so you can see this is a Western conservative guy, and this is a Dallas guy. Now, uh, here's some of the people that you might know that are from this school. Bruce Wilkinson, do you remember him? Yeah. Prayer of Jabez. Yeah. He's a millionaire right now. <laughs> Randy Alcorn. Yes. He wrote the fundamental book on heaven. 
If you have questions about heaven, I, I've been sitting you know, on the Wednesday night and there's a lot of questions coming out about heaven. Randy wrote the definitive work on heaven. It, it's a really well-written book. Randy was on our fact. Tim Tebow's folks, you remember Tim Tebow? His folks were missionaries. They went, Mr. Tebow went to Western. Tim LaHaye. Okay, now Jeff is a real uh, guy on, you know, uh, Revelation. He put on all that stuff about, you know, the end times. That was, Mar that was uh, Tim LaHaye. Mark Driscoll, you probably wouldn't know some of these other guys as well. Stu Weber, Bruce Ware, Max Anders. He's written a lot of books out there. So there are some, you know, eminent people from Western. Okay. So. And that's in Portland, Oregon? Portland, Oregon. Wow, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, yeah. <laughs> I love that city. I mean, it, it really took... To get me out of Portland, because even though I was in Silicon Valley, I, I, I was actually had a home in Oregon, because Intel had a big place up there, and I would fly down to Santa Clara in the Intel plane, you know, boy, I like that, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, yeah, that's in, that's in Portland, Oregon, that place. And when I, when I was thinking about taking this job at Auburn, I had to make a decision to leave Portland, which is a city absolutely beautiful. I'm gonna, I should, if I ever talk to you again, I'll bring in some pictures. I didn't want to leave that city. I came here three times. I told them no three times. Fourth time, I, I, you know, I said, okay, God, I gotta do this. And I kind of was, God was putting more pressure on me, more pressure on me. Finally, I, I thought I heard him say, Mike, get your, to Alabama, <laughs> you know, get your butt to Alabama, and, and I didn't hear the word butt, I heard that other biblical word for that, <laughs> so, <laughs> so here I am, <laughs> all right, now, <clears throat> I'm already running behind time, but that's okay, um, I just want to give you a couple of things that I do uh, to help the people that uh, come to watch us at Crew, other professors, and, uh, they're always asking me, Okay, how much can you get away with in a secular university? Can you just go out there the first day and say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to pepper you with verses every day? Can you do that? Well, you can do that. <laughs> but there's, there, I mean, there's subtler ways to do this, right? And to me, the coaches know how to do this the best. So here's one of the things. Here's three things I do. There's three points I gave them on, you know, how you can glorify your God in teaching. I always had a community service component in all the courses. So I would come in day one, and I would come in with a Snickers bar, <laughs> hold it up during my syllabus. I said, look, you guys, if you guys ever need a special favor, and I'll give you some examples, getting married, mommy's crying every night because you're not home, no clean clothes for days. I actually told them not to come. <laughs> <with their> embarrassing <laughs> Fred hazing incident. Bring me a Snickers bar and I'll feel better about what you did or what you're asking me to do, okay? Now, what I do, especially when I have the 250 class at Parker Hall, uh, by the end of the semester, I've got about 500 Snickers bars, <laughs> okay? No kidding. In fact, one guy, uh, <laughs> one, of <the> last <laughs> one of the last classes I taught in Parker Hall, he, there is a Snickers bar that's about this high and about this wide. <laughs> he brought me that. I mean, he's really wanted an A. <laughs> I said, I can't be bought off. <laughs> so I do that, and then I give all these Snickers bars. I pick a charity, and I take Snickers bars over to the charity. Now, I usually try to pick charities with wayward children who have been abandoned or who have had a tough, rough home situation and the people that are talking to them, the counselors, the social workers, it always goes better if you give a kid a Snickers bar, <coughs> okay? So that tells my class right up front, this guy's different. I wonder if he's a Christian. Then I have all these other things. I'm gonna have to go through this quickly because I, you know, I always <laughs> have way too much material. I sprinkle my lectures with Christ announcing analogies. So here's one where we were talking about this thing in physics. It's the only equation on the, on the test. <laughs> Specific heat is a concept in physics. And I was saying, well, look, 
here's how you remember this. You've all read the, the drama in the Bible of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They go into the furnace, you know. Nebuchadnezzar throws them in the furnace, and they're, they're moonwalking in there. I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're still alive. They survived that. Well, how could God do that if he was working with natural law? <laughs> So, well, he could, he could change their specific heat. Specific heat means, a high specific heat means you can pour the heat to something and its temperature doesn't change. It's like walking into a blast furnace and I'm, man, I'm cozy in there because my temperature, my body has not changed. That's a high specific heat thing. Water has a high specific heat. It's like, that's why you put it in your engine of your car. The engine's producing all those, you know, all those pistons are going, producing a lot of heat. All that heat goes into that water, but the water temperature doesn't change much, right? Because if you look at your temperature gauge on your car, it goes up to about 220 and sticks there. But the engine's still producing heat. Another example, if you take a piece of pie out of an oven, now I actually have done this with a student who did not believe this was true. So I brought in a furnace, I cut a piece of pie in there, I did it right in front of everybody, and I took that piece of pie. She said, I don't believe this. So I said, okay, if you don't believe this, then I can heat up this piece of pie in an oven. Now that's coming out of the same temperature oven. All that's the same temperature. <coughs> but yet the pie crust is cool. But if you bite into that right after it comes out of the oven, that, that pie filling is like red hot, right? She didn't believe that. Okay, and that means that the pie filling has a high specific heat. You know, you're loading heat into it, but the temperature, you know, it's not, it's not cooling off. It wants to stay the same temperature in a sense. It's hot, it stays hot as you bring it out of the oven. Whereas the crust has a low specific heat, it changes its temperature easily, so it cools off quickly. So crust cools off quickly. Pie, the, the filling keeps its heat. And so I'm, I'm okay, I'm down and I'm, I'm I've got the oven up there, I got the piece of pie, I cooked it in front of her, I didn't even use a microwave because I didn't want her to think, you know, I'm do doing some sleight of hand. <laughs> I used a lab oven, brought in a lab oven, then I put on one of these protective things. She said, why are you putting that on? Because when I shove that thing into your mouth, you're gonna spit it right back at me <laughs> because it's so hot. I can tell you, my class remember what specific heat means, right? So I'm doing this all the time. I got about 20 of these things that I'm constantly, you know, I'm trying to help my students, but I'm giving them a hint of what I of what I believe in life. Probably the best thing I do, I, I'm a, I try to be a great teacher. You just try, you know, this isn't hard. I kept telling these kids, the, these other professors around, this isn't hard. You just be good. You be a great teacher. You be a great communicator. That doesn't mean you're easy. But that means you care about your students, you love on your students. This is a lot like a coaching job. I learned more about teaching college from coaches, my coaches, than I ever did from science education courses. They will understand that you've got to be rough on them, that grades matter, and that you love them, and you will help them to get to where they need to be. There's a way to do that. And if you have that personality and you have that bent, that's all you have to do, you know? And I'm lucky in my field because I'm one of the last Americans in physics, so I speak pretty good English. <laughs> and they think, well, I died and went to heaven, let's sign up for Bozak's class because we know he's, he's, he's gonna be a good communicator mm -hmm. and I'll learn something. <laughs> so, so that's all you gotta do. Okay. Now let me show you a little bit of what I do in research. And those of you that have been attached to Auburn a long time, I bet you never, you never knew this stuff existed over there. In fact, there's presidents of Auburn who we hope don't know what we're doing <laughs> back there. Now, we're not so lucky with Chris. <laughs> Chris Roberts, Chris was hired about when I was. And Chris uh, was in chemical engineering for many years as a professor, then he was the head of chemical engineering, then he was the head of the whole engineering department, now he's the head of all Auburn, I can't, I can't badmouth him anymore. 
So, but, but he knows what this is, you know. We do have <coughs> some heavy duty equipment over here. This is a, a 2 MeV particle accelerator. Did you know we had a particle accelerator at Auburn? You probably didn't. Now this 2 MeV means this thing operates at 2 million volts. 2 million. What comes out of the wall is 120 and that will kill you. This is a fusion device. Talk about fusion, back, back, back at the stuff with Lawrence Livermore. We have a small scale fusion reactor at Auburn. Looks like this. We have to build these things, by the way. You know, there's physicists who do number crunching. They kind of try to predict things with equations. And there's physicists like me who are experimentalists who build equipment to measure things that have never been measured. These are sort of examples of this. So this is what this looks like, and I could go through, I, <laughs> I, could, I could give you an hour lecture on this, you guys, but you don't want to. I want you to sleep you on me. You have to build a fusion to pay for power to put in the other. <laughs> that's right, you do. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. By the way, this thing gets up to 2 million degrees inside of it. 2 million degrees. We need, we need to get up there in the millions of degrees to study these fusions. We're really trying to make a star harness it on planet Earth and tap the energy off of it. That's what we're trying to do now. The, the sun's temperature is like 17 million, so we've got a ways to go. <laughs> but but um, uh, I like kind of messing with my students, you can tell. <coughs> so here's what we'll do. You know, we've we got to train them up pretty good before they can use these things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there'll come a day when we say, it's kind of like going on the court, you know, is the first time, you know, you've been on the basketball court as a freshman. There comes a day when we don't let them know this, but say, I'm gonna let you push the button on that thing today. <laughs> you know, I'll let you push the button on that two million degree, or two million volts. We'll let you push the button on there, and there's two million degrees in the middle of that thing. That's a really sobering time, <laughs> and it's scary. <laughs> so, but really, it is sobering when, and by the way, this thing is about as big as this room. This thing lies in a lab that's uh, about maybe two or two of these rooms. Okay, down in the, down at the center, but beyond the center field <laughs> scoreboard in <laughs> Plainsman Park, okay? So if you really hit a long home run, you'd hit the back end of my building, <laughs> okay? Uh, so, uh, but it's sobering when you're, when you're standing out here and you know that two feet away from you is two million degrees. So, and this goes to, what I try to teach my physics students, you have to know what you're doing. You can't memorize the back, the, uh, the odd answers in the back of that book. You've got to know what you're doing. Or we're not even gonna let you near these things uh, because, you know, <laughs> we don't wanna be sued. <laughs> All right, now, <coughs> I'm gonna give you one, two more slides and then I'll quit. I, I've got a lot more I could talk to you about. But I do want to, I, wa I wanna show some of you parents what we're trying to do with maybe some of your kids if, if, if you, your kid was a science or engineering student. We tend to work through centers at Auburn and this is one of the first centers that uh, about four of us started uh, about 20 years ago. It's called the Center for Advanced Vehicle and Extreme Environmental Electronics, you gotta have an acronym, CAVE, <laughs> C-A-V-E, to the three power is Extreme Environmental Electronics, okay? And you can see what we're doing here. We're dealing with extreme environments and we're trying to help the United States basically as a country in defense and uh, anything that has a really difficult environment. Now let me show you what I, what I call uh, as a difficult environment here. That's my phone telling me it's uh, 7.15. Huh. Um, extreme environment is one with extreme temperatures. <laughs> okay, my, maybe not as, as extreme as 2 million, but the extreme temperatures of space or down in oil wells or things like that. High radiation, I can tell you if we ever get in a war with China, what they're gonna do is they're gonna put a missile up there and they're gonna spray radiation all over to knock out all of our communication satellites. So we have a lot of things in Auburn over there 
that Chris knows about, but <laughs> none of the other presidents do, where we can hit it with a lot of radiation and see if electronics is still going to work and how it fails. High vibration, you've seen that as, you know, you remember those pictures of the spacecraft going up and they show the capsule and you know, <laughs> everything is shaking around while well, the electronics is shaking around too. Right. And so we need, to, we need to figure out what's going on with that to prevent it. Corrosive surroundings, uh, that's mostly low earth orbit. You think if objects in space, there's nothing out there, it's a vacuum, uh on -uh. There's a lot of toxic species out there, and the, the, the main one is called atomic oxygen, which is O2 we breathe. O2 is what we need in life, but if you break apart O2 into two individual oxygen atoms, they're extremely reactive. The sun's rays hit those molecules in the atmosphere and break them up into atomic oxygen, we call it. It's extremely corrosive to space modules spacecraft, any kind of electronics up there. We had to figure that out about 25 years ago, what was going on up there. And it was, you know, we could, put, we could put metal up there and it would be gone when it comes back to Earth because it just got eaten up like acid. So, uh, one last one on this, and this is what I wanted to tell you about in terms of your kids. The way we do this is we're trying to save y'all taxpayer money, <laughs> okay? We said, look, we don't want to go up to Washington all the time with, you know, our, our begging bowl, like a lot of professors have to do. And Auburn didn't have a, a good reputation in science when I got here. So we were <laughs> sitting around saying, look, Let's just, let's just get rid of the whole government. <laughs> let's go to our friends in corporate America. And so this is, these are the first, this is, this is how we run this center. This is the business model. We've made, a, we've made relationships with all of these companies, many of them Fortune 500, mainly electronics firms, some of them with the extreme environment, you know, needs, some not, okay? See, these guys here, that's all the military. <laughs> and so they, they want, you know, us to study a lot of these things I've been mentioning. Now, Intel doesn't want, they, they typically, you know, don't put their stuff down in oil wells. <laughs> so, but anyway, we made arrangements with all these guys. It took us about five years to develop relationships. And here's what we do. We say, we go to, I went back to Intel. I said, look, you guys don't have enough engineers to do everything you want. You don't do much long-term research. Why don't you let us do that long-term research and we'll do it really cheap. So if you give us $100,000, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to you about what projects you want us to do that will help Intel. We'll negotiate that. We'll do this project over a year, two years, whatever. So $100,000 is a year. So we had these companies joining CAVE as a, a partner with us. And the good part for the students is we put students on this. You can see how many students we got in this center, 35 uh, MS and PhD students. So we support all these students with money. So if one of the nice things about science and engineering, if you can make it to grad school, you can make it the rest of the way because we support all of your stuff. Most of us, most of the schools with science departments of any magnitude or engineering departments will support your students tuition free. You make about 25,000 in our case a year and we put you on, I might put you on that Intel project. Now every two times a year, all these guys come to Auburn and we give them a dog and pony show what we was doing for you. <laughs> And we have our students do this. And then, now look, if you're a manager at Intel, and I was one time, and you got a guy at Auburn doing work on projects that are interesting to Intel, who are you gonna hire? You're gonna hire my guy. So this thing has 100% placement, 100%. Except, I, you know, we have a few Chinese students and you know, we lost them, we don't know where they are back there, but the people we know for about 20 years, we've had 100% placement. 
of, of and, and you're working right on projects that are of interest in, of interest to society. Okay, so I'll, I'll quit there. And uh, you get a feel though, and what what it is for the Christian. I get into all of these companies. You have a Christian visiting and representing your school in all these companies. And they come to Auburn and they love Auburn. I, I mean, I have guys from Washington who just come down here and they said, well, we heard that you guys are just put on a great meeting and you have good food, you know, at the conference center. We just want to get out of Washington. We're coming down to listen to your talks. And they're not, they're not even connected to us in any way. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so anyway. Okay, let me let me march forward here and look at the science photos, okay? Because I'm I'm gonna try to make make it out of here. Now I've got about 15 of these, okay? Okay, here's the first one. Now they're not all this complicated, but I just want to tell you about the magnitude and grandeur of God, and this is why I love this field. Because you're seeing God up close and personal from a different point of view of the Bible, but yet it's totally compatible with the Bible. And this just tells you how what a genius this God is that we worship. And sometimes I leave that lab and I go down on my knees. I really do. I mean, <laughs> I'm hoping it's not being filmed by somebody over there. <laughs> now this is our this is our home. Okay, this is the Milky Way galaxy. Now, a, a fifth grader asked me a good question about this. They said, well, how'd you get that picture? Uh, I heard you couldn't go at the speed of light, so how'd you get that far away from our galaxy to look back and take that picture? This is a galaxy that's like ours, <laughs> okay? Uh, our galaxy is a typical spiral galaxy. Now, where we are located is right there in that dot. That's where our sun is. So that's our home. And we're in this Hipparchus region of the galaxy. Now, some of these numbers are just mind-boggling. Milky Way has about 100 billion stars. That's that many. Current estimate is that the universe has two trillion of these galaxies. Two trillion of these. Okay? Thus, there are about 200 billion trillion stars in the universe which is, they actually have a, a, a word for that, <laughs> sextillion, 200 sextillion. That's 221 zeros. There's that many stars like our sun. That, that's, gotta, that's gotta just blow your mind. You know, that, that, that it gets back to that verse. There's nothing like our God takes by the way, we're traveling around this. It takes 260 so or sort of million years for us to go around the, the middle of the galaxy. Okay? Yeah. yeah, the other picture is a blow up of right here in the center. Look how many stars. Every dot is a star, like our sun. <coughs> Let me show you what you're looking at. You guys have, have you ever seen the Milky Way? You go outside and look at the Milky Way. You know, it's, we're, we're kind of light polluted here in the Opelika area. But if you get out like in Oregon, you can look up and you see this band in the sky that looks like that. That's the Milky Way. So we're looking at the center of our Milky Way from Earth. So where you're, here's how you're looking in that picture. Let me go back one. <coughs> here's where we are, our sun, and then the planets are around there. And it, it, it's as though God took a knife and severed through the Milky Way to make a cross section. And we're looking that way, and we see this cross section in that picture that I was just showing you over there. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the cross section of the galaxy. So we're three-fifths of the way out and looking toward the center where the density of stars is highest. Here's a, a map of the southern hemisphere and our galactic center, we can't see this from our latitude, we gotta go down to the South America, but the galactic center here is in the constellation Sagittarius, can't see that, you gotta go to Peru or whatever. And uh, here's some other star, Alpha Centauri is the nearest star to Earth. Now do I have any science geeks here? How, how far is it to the nearest star, do you remember? How much? 
4.3 light years. So going at the speed of light, 4.3 <laughs> years, you get to that nearest star, Alpha Centauri. By the way, that's a triple star. Most stars in the universe are not like ours, a single star, they're doubles or triples. So we're, we have an unusual system. Now, if you, were in, if you were in that system, you'd see three sunrises and three sunsets every day, <laughs> right? Is it the sun coming up there, the second one there? <laughs> so that'd be, that'd be too wild. <laughs> Okay, while we're on astronomy, uh, let me show you the sun. This is a picture of the sun as we kind of know it. It looks really homogeneous, we call it, kind of uniform. Nothing is, could be further from the truth. If you take this and you blow it up, it looks like that. If you take that and you blow it up again, it looks like that. And if you blow it up again, it looks like that. It looks it's really granular. We just don't see that with our naked eye. Now, these granules are just basically they're they're convective gases that go up and down <laughs> so if this is the surface of the sun you know hot air rises hot air closer to the center of the sun it rises cools off at the limb of the sun and goes back down goes back up <laughs> goes back down so each of these granules is a convective cell zone turns out now <coughs> There are two millions attached to this figure. The diameter of the sun is about a million miles of the sun. Now it's 240,000 miles to the moon, four times to the moon. And you'd just be going through the sun. That's how big that is. That's why it's so hard to get fusion <laughs> on Earth because that thing's got everything it needs. It's got a lot of mass and it's got a lot of heat and it's really hot in the interior of that sucker. So God knew how to do all of this, you know. How do we know it's that hot in there? We get in there. Uh, there's, there's actually very easy ways I could teach you in five minutes <laughs> about how we do this. We analyze the light, okay? And we can see what's going on in there. You know, there's ways that we can kind of penetrate that outer atmosphere and look into that star <coughs> and sense, and know how hot it is in the interior. There's, 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 there's sensors that we have that allow you to do that, but it's mostly based on light. In astronomy, you can't fly out to the star and put a thermometer in it, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, you don't know this, but it turns out you'd be fried way before you get to the sun because as you approach the sun, the, the temperature goes up to a million degrees, and then it comes back down right at the surface of the sun, which is 24, 2500 degrees, and then as you go into the star, it goes back up to, you know, 17 million. So the, the space shuttle, <laughs> if it got too close to it, but not even on this, the, the surface is the coolest part of the sun. The surface of the sun is the coolest. And it's because it's got a lot of gas. You see, here's a solar flare. Those things are going out there and, and putting all kinds of temperature out there. These things, and that's the Earth. <laughs> so these solar flares are so big, you can see that they engulf the Earth as far as what the size of these uh, uh, convective cells are, that's Texas, okay, by comparison. So this is one star, you know, this is, this is how awesome, God, God, has a bunch, God has more energy than we think, <laughs> he can do anything. Now these are some more biology and I'll go through these quickly because it's time to go. <coughs> this is nine week of gestation. Every woman's hope needs to have that picture, right? Because science has really, uh, you know, did a lot for the, you know, pro-life movement. We had to get to science enough where we could start taking photographs of what was really going on in the womb and cell mitosis, meiosis, et cetera. Okay, these are some electron microscope pictures just for fun. <laughs> and uh, some of these I can't tell you how I took them, but <laughs> this is a red blood cell being woven into a blood clot. That's why blood is clotting there. The other one is, I wanted to see how good my Norelco razor was. <laughs> so that's a sliced beard hair over there. Insects are really interesting. That's the head of a common housefly. See that? 
I wish I could turn these off more. This other thing here, you see this is the mouth of the fly. That's a blow up of the mouth. And look at all the, look at all the design on this. I just hit the fly. Now, you know what my grad students are doing. I'm saying, why don't we swat the fly and put it back in the microscope and see what that looks like. And there's eye sockets everywhere. This is it's ugly. <laughs> so, but see that compound eye, that's why you can't swat a fly. That's their eye, they, they, got, they got so many eye sockets there. Uh, you can't. Uh, there's a honeybee face. Now imagine my shock on this. That's the face and I was kind of expecting that, that kind of a face for the honeybee. But I really, when I went down in here, magnification wise with the eye, look at the, the honeycomb section. Can you guys see that out there? It's all honeycomb, a nice design. And I said, well, what, what is all this? Well, I had to go ask an entomologist at Auburn. <laughs> Here's what this is. This is a safety device for a honeybee. Now imagine, you, you've seen the old uh, movie theaters where the, the light is going up on the screen and you see all this suspended dust that you can't see. This thing's flying through all of that. So he's getting flack. You know, it's gonna, I mean, I'm, it's gonna wipe my eyes out. Well, these things are protecting his eye. They kind of snow plow through all that dust in the air. <laughs> so. Whiskers. Yeah, whiskers. exactly, yeah. Um, mosquito, <coughs> that's the thing that goes into you. <laughs> and there's a hu healthy human hair. Now we did do permed hair, we did uh, dyed hair, we did, uh, it's, it's ugly <coughs> what perm does, so don't do that, ladies. I mean, it's like a tree and King Kong took it and it just cracks along, you know, it's, it's ugly. Uh, student wanted me to do marijuana. <laughs> then it's the AU stationery as paper. Really nice bonded paper. Okay, now here's some, we'll just take this quick. I, I won't tell you what these are. Anybody can guess what that is? Just, just holler out, anybody. It can be as crazy as possible. Golf ball? Oh, well. As an eggshell. You didn't know what eggshell look like that, right? Okay, how about this? Now you guys should know this because you're all breathing this right now. Look at pollen. That's exactly right. That's pollen spores. Okay, how about that one? Record. You get a free copy of my book. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? It's a vinyl record. Oh, yeah, wow. old school vinyl record, and I took the part of Diana Ross and the Supremes because I'm a Michigander. You can't hurry love. Was that needle as it tracked over there? You could hear Diana singing. Okay, was that thing oscillated the same way that her vocal cords made that original sound? How about that? You eat that. I had one this morning. Breakfast, fruit, strawberries. Okay. Really? Yeah, that's what strawberries look like. I'll go this quick cell wall. Now, let me just leave you with this one. This is worth you staying for, if I can get it to work here. This is a, uh, can you hear this? Just watch, it's only one minute. Down the centuries, biologists have wondered why every face has this particular feature. It's this bit here, the groove underneath your nose. It's called the filtrum. I've got quite a filtrum. prominent one. Right. This is less prominent, but we've all got one. What we now know is it is the place where the puzzle that is the human face finally all comes together. We've taken data from scans of a developing embryo, so we are able to show you, for the very first time, how our faces don't just grow, but fit together like a puzzle. The three main sections of the puzzle meet in the middle of your top lip, creating the groove that is your filtrum. This whole amazing process, the bits coming together to produce a recognizable human face, happens in the womb between two and three months. If it doesn't happen then, it never will. 
So check check your uh, partner's <laughs> spot there, okay? <laughs> now, let me end you with this quote. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite quotes. I wish, I wish Jeff was here. I think he'd like this quote. And it's how I really feel, too. For the scientist who has lived his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. <laughs> He's scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak as he pulls himself over the last rock. He's greeted by a band of theologians who've been waiting there for centuries. Isn't that the case, right? Well, that's it, you guys. Let me say a word of prayer. Thank you for staying a little bit, uh, five minutes late here. And uh, listen, I hope to meet you guys personally, all of you. I mean, this is the church that I think I'm going to attach to now. And there's a lot I think I could do to help your children. Um, you know, because I've been in all these colleges. If you have a question on that, in fact, I didn't even have time to talk to you about the books I've written. Here's one of them. I'll just give a couple of these out. You get one, sir. Um, this is for parents uh, on how to get your kids ready for college. It's written, you know, it's straight talk. Um, I don't mince words. I talk about why they're in trouble why when they go to college they usually get blown out of the water and this is what you as parents can do to help that process that so you don't freak out it's called avoiding a parental freak out now, i didn't have control unfortunately of the title but i did if they uh, they said okay that's that's will be our title i said you better get me a woman who's freaking out on the cover <laughs> and that's what they came up with <laughs> okay now i have an accompanying book that's just for students that I wrote 10 years ago, but it has a lot of the same things about just trying to help your kids do better as Christian uh, kids as they go to school. Because we need your kids to do well, survive. There's fewer and fewer of us that are out there in the world. And, you know, we need replenishment. We need reinforcements. From, we, we need kids that really do well in college, go out there and do well in, in their professions, live for God, etc. cetera. So, um, sir, that one's yours. <laughs> I don't want to carry this home. Anybody else might want one? Oh, oh she, had her, she had her hand up first. But <laughs> can you get, how, how good of a, are you a good athlete? Okay. <laughs> now for the rest of you, I got a free bookmark if you want this, okay? But visit my websites. This is my this is my uh, supper. Let me say a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity to be with these good people. Thank you, Father, for what you've led in life. Each of us has a story to tell, Father. And sometimes I always I ask my students go home and talk to your mom and dad. And you find out their rap sheet, their resume, what they did to raise you, the years of struggle that they had, and how God got them through. This is just my story, Father. Thank you, Father, for this church. We pray for the people that are away at the beach and also in Israel. Thank you again for Pastor Jeff giving me a chance to come by and talk tonight. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.